had it. Uh, Representative Lanou is up next. Representative Lanou? Sorry about that. I was uh, not um, well, muted. I was muted. Uh, can you, okay, so you can hear me well now, I take it. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Judge, uh, Mr. Hallstrom, uh, Ms. Connor, thank you so much for your testimony and for appearing before the committee uh, today. I, uh, I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> just real briefly, uh, before I get into the uh, storm response, I just want to uh, uh, make you aware, I'm sure you are, but my, uh, my, my district uh, was hit uh, disproportionately hard by the economic impact of COVID. Um, and we're, um, we're strong people out here. We're resilient. We're, we're very vulnerable. Um, and people have a very, feel very strongly about standing on your own two feet, uh, making your own way. They're very, we're very proud people. Uh, but I'm going to tell you, I had several conversations, uh, dozens, as a matter of fact, and that's no exaggeration between on the phone and also in person. People are scared to death and don't know what to do regarding these rate increases, these proposed rate increases when they serve their bill. I've had families tell me they have to make decisions about feeding their families or keeping their lights on. That's the point we're at. So this is this, this is the crux. I have seniors tell me they, they're skipping, they may have to skip medicine and uh, skip certain dosages or not take a uh, prescription altogether or uh, pay to keep their lights on. P people are scared. They're, they're asking, they're telling me they're scared and they don't know what to do. So we need to find a solution to this. We need to, uh, this can't be a Republican or Democrat issue. We all have to come to the table and we have to find a meaningful solution and find it uh, quickly. Um, so aside from um, with that said, I do have a couple of a comment and a couple of questions regarding the um, the storm response that we that we that we had um one one specific uh, constituent uh, there was a uh, there's a lady with a uh, chronic health condition where our first responders there's an ambulance that has to get dispatched two or more times a week uh to respond to her and uh, it was uh the uh, her road was, was was blocked and there was a concern that they were, we were scared to death that um, we wouldn't, what, what, what if uh, she needs that first response? And it was about a 24 hour period from the, from the storm to they're able to, to clear that road. Uh, so where, where, I'm, where I'm going with this is, is there, do you guys have a list of uh, people with disabilities, people with chronic health conditions that, that you keep, that we can make sure these people are on those lists so there can be, uh, that that's would be priorities. We do have a list of critical care pest, uh, customers that are obviously a top priority in the crisis. I'll ask Ms. Corner to add uh, her insights on it, please. Yes, Mr. Judge, uh, Representative Lanou, we do maintain a list. We reach out to our customers and encourage them to uh, update that list as customers call us and express that they have uh, conditions. We uh, recommend that they uh, apply to be uh, on to that list. So prior to a storm, we reach out to our medically coded customers, in this case, well over 14,000, to let them know that a storm is on the way and to encourage them to make the appropriate, uh, appropriate accommodations that they need to make to ensure that they are safe uh, and that uh, we also connect them with their local uh, communities uh, and for the Connecticut, uh, 211 Connecticut, for other um, support services that they may need. Uh, but it, it breaks my heart to hear the stories from these customers. Uh, these storms impact all of us, uh, but particularly our most vulnerable customers and uh, providing them with that support um, and outreach ahead of time is intended to help them ensure that they make the appropriate arrangements ahead of time, uh, depending on their situation, uh, because the power could be out for many days, and that's what uh, we try to communicate to them. What, 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 what would you consider um, the appropriate accommodations, the appropriate uh, uh, 
what, what should they do? What would, uh, what would you consider that? I think it depends on the customer. Some of them have medical supplies that, that require certain uh, certain treatments. Some have devices that need to be charged. So in that case, they may uh, ensure that everything is charged up and that they have spares on hand. For some customers, it may mean that they need to connect with family members to ensure that they've got a backup plan. Um, we work with the communities and each uh, the community liaison work with the communities on uh, the community priorities. And so as the community identifies priorities, that's why we're connecting in with those communities to ensure that they're also aware of these medical customers. There may be other priorities that the community has. So we work with the communities to identify how we can best respond to the most important needs in that community. But when it comes to the medically coded, uh, we encourage customers that part of what we're doing there is making sure that they're uh, aware, aware ahead of the storm to make appropriate preparations uh, during the event and then during the event we will reach out and work with the communities as as the event continues on to make sure um, and to check in on those customers but it it is a difficult situation because I think I mean, there, there, are, there are people that may have uh, their house designed in such a way where the the, uh, the, the equipment set up uh, the uh, it's, it's retrofitted in such a way to uh, meet their uh, medical uh, medical needs and it's not. Uh, it's not very feasible necessarily for all of them to just pack up and have a uh, have an alternative plan, and especially on short notice. So um, I think we have to be cognizant of that as well. Um, another another issue uh, that happened uh, in the district was there was uh, some uh, down um, power lines that were still active that caused a had caused a fire uh, in the. Uh, in a district, we were worried that it was going to spread. Uh, apparently, the first selectman was trying to get somebody, as well as the uh, fire department, was trying to get somebody from Eversource on the phone to de-energize the lines uh, in order for the uh, fire and first responders to go and do their job. Uh, they were unsuccessful for quite some time. Matter of fact, the uh, first selectman had to reach out to reach out to Senator Summers. Uh, but it was, in, it was around 10 30 at night she was probably successful in getting a hold of somebody my concern is that it, it took a it took a legislative initiative a legislative response to make that happen um my concern is what are we going to do to make it make sure there's that direct line uh between our the municipal leaders and our first responders in a situation like that where they can get somebody immediately on the uh from uh, from every source on the phone on the horn uh, and, and get get, get it moving. Yeah. So if I may, um, the fire departments and police departments have a direct line to us. They have we have what we call fire and police safety categories, uh, where a fire and police safety FPS one is life endangering, life threatening, and those get our immediate attention. Um, a fire chief can call us and ask us to de-energize a town. And, and we have done that in the past. That's, that's not a decision that anybody takes lightly, but uh, fire and police have a direct line into, into our company just for those reasons. All right, it seems like they like took a great amount of time in order to uh, get a response. So that's a, that's a concern um, I have as far as we have to, uh, uh, I mean, it took up to 1030 at night uh, when there was, a, there was an active fire, it couldn't spread, thank God it didn't. But um, that's a that's a that's another concern. We need to make sure we have that uh, direct line of communication. So, um, then just one uh, one final question um, I have, uh, uh, sort of a follow up to the uh, the, the, quick, the Q and A you had with Representative uh, Buckby, um, Mr. Hallstrom. I think you said you guys are actively looking to hire twenty five to thirty uh, line workers that, to get them essentially on parity back to. 2011 uh, numbers roughly of, of line workers now uh, my um my i guess my, my my extended question to that is um over the next um say year three years five years uh how many line workers do you anticipate that you're going to either they're going to leave uh service or will retire from uh ever source well, it depends. I mean, sometimes, you know, we use, you know, depending on the situation, maybe a 3% attrition rate. So, um, 
you know, we're always trying to stay ahead of attrition because it takes so long to, um, to train alignment, basically four and a half, five years. So part of what we do is we anticipate that, that attrition rate. So at a lot, at a last rate case, um, we, we, um, had an agreement that we could hire a hundred incremental people over, over the three years of the rate case. We're in the last year of that and we've, we've done that, uh, each year, but, um, that's, that's incremental. So we actually hire, hired more line workers just to keep pace with attrition. So that's, that's something we put into our formula when we're looking to, um, hold linemen classes and in a new, uh, you know, new group of new employees. So these 25 to 30 that you said you're currently hiring, are you planning on hiring more to get more people into the, into essentially into that pipeline to become line workers and, uh, so we can, we can keep up with that. So we don't have such a, uh, uh, such a decrease in, uh, line workers like we, like we've seen. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll keep that number, um, you know, um, once we re reach our level of line work is, and you know, if it's, you know, the 2011 to 12, you know, whatever that, that 400 number, 450, um, we, we tend to have classes every year for line workers. I mean, it's something we do all the time. We have a, a large training facility in Berlin. So it's not something that we only do once in a while. We have line work is in, in progress, so to speak, uh, almost continuously. Uh, thank you for your answers. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Representative.